Tonight's training is marked as judicial review of migration decisions. And last week we went through some, we went through the basic definition of refugee, which I know you've all looked at in a lot of detail with Con from that practical point of view. But what we did is we went through some of the elements and some of the tests so that we hopefully have a broad understanding of what the relevant tests are. And I can around the handout, not too, I hope it's not too dense. I don't, you're not gonna be tested on it. Um, and it might be a useful reference guide for you. I really tried to extract some decisions that I think are helpful to know about. And at the beginning, I've tried to recap some of what was discussed last week. So I do want to take it slow. Again, none of this is intended or meant to be overwhelming in any way. Hopefully you find it useful tonight. Okay? So if we turn to the beginning of this document and revisit again, refugee, what is a refugee? We see the definition extracted that we know comes from the convention and that we know reappears in the Migration Act, section 36. And last week we went through some of those elements. What does well-founded fear mean? What causal connection is required? What is required um, for a decision maker to look at and consider? Because again, if we know that foundation, we're able to look at a decision and ask ourselves whether maybe there has been an error. Okay, so very quickly, we considered well-founded fear and I've extracted, I think as I promised to last week, some of those decisions that I cited and they're mainly the High Court ones that are cited regularly. Um, and you can probably, if you jump onto Osley, find different lower courts who have applied the relevant tests. So well-founded fear, we went through the fact that it's subjective and objective doesn't have to be 50%. If we see that in a decision, we're going to be alarmed. We Decision makers are not meant to talk in language of balance of probabilities or beyond reasonable doubt, and it's a forward thinking test. So if we have a decision that is confined simply to the past, not considering what is likely to happen in the future, well, that would suggest error. The past is a useful guide, but not solely determinative. So I've extracted some of those um, cases and broad principles. Persecution, what that means, serious harm, the relevant provisions of the Migration Act, and what some of the principles that apply, such as the person not being required to take steps to avoid persecution. And I quoted the case that I referred to last week, which dealt with the man who was gay from Bangladesh, and that decision is S395-2002. And it endorses that general principle, but we can obviously see that it might have application in other scenarios beyond sexuality. If there is an onus or a requirement that a decision maker places on an applicant to stop doing what they're doing, be discreet in their political activities. If they adopt that type of reasoning or process of decision making, again, it might suggest an error. Um, four reasons of the causal nexus, and again, it's not a but-for test. It doesn't have to be the sole reason, and last week we looked at the fact that a person might be motivated by convention-based reason, equally might be motivated by greed. That's not an unusual situation, and when you're looking at a decision, um, if it turns on such a finding, if it turns on a finding, that the harm feared is not convention-based, you want to pay particular attention to that. You know, if there's a finding that it's private only, it's privately motivated, it's a land dispute, um, it's a 
occurring within a family context. Uh, the specific reasons, the cases extracted there really deal with the particular social group. And there's a lot of authority dealing with that particular convention ground. And often a decision maker needs to turn their mind to and ask themselves, is the purported group capable of constituting a particular social group for the purposes of the convention? Is the applicant, if yes, is the applicant a member of that group? And then again, if yes, we go to the causal connection. Is the feared persecution by reason of that membership? So they're often the questions, and it might, you might have a decision where it stops at that first question, no, this is not capable of constituting a particular social group. And if that's so, you'd want to pay particular attention to that and look at some of the cases dealing with this aspect. Unable or unwilling to avail him or herself of the protection of their country. <coughs> no requirement of guaranteed protection. And the um, well-known authority cited here for you about what is required. What level of protection is needed? Reasonable measures. The state needs to take reasonable measures to protect the lives and safety of its citizens. An appropriate, relatively effective, efficient criminal justice system. Now, some of the other issues, so that's just a recap, guys, of those um, elements and some of the broad principles that attach to them. Some other issues that I think we canvassed most of them last week, um, no onus of proof on an applicant. It is for the applicant though to make their case and to present their material and their evidence. The tribunal is inquisitorial, but it's not burdened by the responsibility or obligation of making inquiries and making the case for the applicant. That's a broad principle. It's a general principle and it is subject to some qualifications. And I've cited a case of Minister for Immigration and Citizenship versus SZIAI. And I'm hoping that I'm not going to move around too much, but I brought some of my cases with me just to maybe place them within the factual context so that we can understand it a bit better. So the, the general rule is that the tribunal is not obliged to make these inquiries, okay? But in this particular case, SZIAI, and it is the case that is most usually quoted when you're trying to make the argument that this is one of those limited or exceptional cases. Um, there was a letter obtained and it related to um, a particular uh, group in Bangladesh. The tribunal there made the inquiry so effectively was responsible for generating this document and what the court stresses here as I've attempted to stress is it's only very confined it's in only very limited circumstances um, they repeat there's no general obligation to make inquiries to do anything including to test the authenticity of documents but where an inquiry initiated by the tribunal itself as in this case, places the authenticity of documents before it issue. So the inquiry itself has placed in issue the authenticity of certain documents provided by the applicant in this case. Further inquiries should be made to resolve the conflict of that emergence. And here, there were some contact numbers and there was something that could have been done, you know, contact the author of the report, or the letters, that, that type of thing. Um, 
and it was found here that given its significance, and again, given the fact that it was an inquiry initiated and generated by the tribunal, it was required to go that one step further and make a relatively obvious inquiry and take a relatively obvious step. So the unusual situation, very confined, but not a bad thing to, to, to know in case you're reading a decision and you think, well, it's a bit unfair. Why didn't the tribunal, um, and it might be, an example might be somebody's really ill and they say, well, I, I'm not able to understand you. I'm, I'm feeling very unwell. Um, that might raise a whole bunch of issues, but if the tribunal hearing continues and say they give the doctors contact details or something like that and the tribunal does nothing with it, it might be, this is just a general example, but it might be a basis to go on and, and consider at least as a ground, is this one of those cases where the tribunal was required and obliged to make an inquiry? Case. I mean, what would it be, guys? Well, what do you think in the example I've given? Phoning up the doctor, contacting them in some way, and getting an opinion with the applicant's consent. I mean, if the applicant withholds consent, it might complicate this theoretical example, but calling up and getting an opinion as to capacity. It might be that type of a situation. But again, the general rule doesn't usually assist the applicant, unfortunately. Um, moving along other issues, I spoke about last time 91R3, so I just had that in mind, and, and that was uh, the one about if you find that the applicant has made a claim or, or engaged in conduct, sorry, for the purpose of strengthening their case, that conduct can be disregarded. So important to know for this part of the process, and important to know for the earlier parts that Con has spent a lot of time taking you through in case you do have a, a new type of claim that, that we discussed, you know, the religious claim, conversion while in Australia, etc. So um, you should be aware of that provision. Relocation, there was some discussion about this last week because the general principle is that if an applicant can establish a well-founded fear of persecution. Basically, a real chance cannot be established if he or she can relocate. And I think I used the example of Kabul, we've had that a number of times for clients from Afghanistan, and they're typically being a finding that has often, in my experience here, been difficult to challenge that relocation will solve the problem and cure it and takes the person outside of the convention. But remember that there is a test. If you have a decision that turns on relocation, you will have the decision finding that the person is at risk, at least in their area. So you will have a positive finding. It will go on at the end of that to consider relocation and it needs to apply the test. And I've um, extracted and quoted the cases that state that for us, and it involves considerations of what is reasonable in the sense of practicable, and it must depend upon the particular circumstances of the applicant and the impact upon the person of relocation. And one of the cases that I've cited, Plaintiff M13, 2011, is a case that I ran for the, the centre. And I referred to last week what happens if the delegate's decision is made and a person is outside of the time of it to appeal to the RRT. What are our appeal options as far as court's concerned? Come on. <laughs> if you've got a client who has not appealed to the RRT within that period of time, okay, 
Where would you go if you wanted to challenge the delegate's decision? That's right. Okay, thank you. And the reason for that, again, is because the Federal Circuit Court does not have jurisdiction, and this is in that handout with the various sections, to consider a primary decision. So it goes to the High Court, and that's why we ended up in the High Court in that case. And it was a very unwell um, woman from Malaysia, and there were findings there that she could relocate. But what um, His Honour Justice Hayne found was there were two problems with the finding, and that is, number one, the delegate's decision was very brief. The woman didn't um, appear or didn't have an interview with the delegate. So there was scant information. But the delegate's decision, firstly, did not know where she actually came from in her country. So it really does beg the question, how can relocation cure anything if you don't actually know where she might be relocating to, where she's going, where she's come from? So there was a big question mark over that. And secondly, she was an elderly woman, no family, clear psychiatric issues, maybe not so apparent when she was back home but there was no consideration of these issues, of her personal circumstances, because you have to turn your mind to that in order to apply properly the test of reasonableness. And from a judicial review perspective, we would be wanting to turn our mind to, has the proper test been applied? Has it been stated? Just because it appears in the decision, it might not mean that it's actually been applied correctly. So stated, applied, and then further, was it raised with the applicant? Sometimes it's apparent from a decision if it was. Um, and were the objections made by the applicant? Because if it's usually raised with the person at the tribunal hearing, they will often, as you would expect them to do, say, well, I can't move there because of so many reasons, because maybe I'm at risk there still, because I've got a large family, I have no um, other supports in that area, um, I can't access health um, treatment in that area, and I have special needs. There, you can imagine, there'd be a whole host of different considerations that somebody might put forward and they need to be considered in properly applying the test for relocation. Um, last of all, and I'm pretty sure I didn't mention this last week, <coughs> but another issue that arises um, from time to time in these decisions is the expression um, or the test of laws of general application. So in other words, you might have an applicant who says, well, I left Iran illegally, and as a consequence, I'm going to return and I will be questioned, <coughs> I will be detained, I consequently will face um, serious harm. And often the way in which that matter is dealt with is a consideration of country information, what the laws are, and there will be a finding that I've seen um, quite often where it's accepted but it's considered to be a law of general application. So not one that, when we go back to the convention test, it does make sense. <coughs> not one that is causally related to those factors, but one that affects many. And I quoted there a fairly recent case, it's quite a good one to, to look at, um, WZAPN of Justice North. And... It's a good case to look at because his honour 
looks at those issues of serious harm and persecution that we were discussing in a bit more detail last week and the way in which they ought to be constructed, consistent with international human rights law. So it's a really interesting decision that I would uh, recommend. But in terms of this issue of general uh, laws of general application, the general test is if the law is appropriate and adapted to achieving some legitimate object of the country concerned. So again, guys, it doesn't surprise us, just as relocation will exclude you, doesn't surprise us that there are tests, and we've gone through those. General laws of general application, same type of thing. I think it's okay to think of it as an exclusionary type um, uh, of provision, and there's the test, or the legal test that applies, yes. What's a law of general application? Yes, so an example is I've left illegally and I'm going to be detained. Um, that's one example. And uh, that may be right, I'm going to be questioned and detained. It may be right because there are laws that say you can't leave the country illegally. Um, so it's their laws. Yes, their laws, the country. Another one might be um, I had um, an Iranian client um, and it, um, part of his claim concerned tattoos. And there were moral um, codes that found their way in legislation which prescribed um, <coughs> something as, I think that we all take for granted that tattooing or tattoos. And again, he had a claim, or part of his claim was that it was religious. There, there were religious artifacts um, uh, tattooed on him. But in terms of the tattooing, it was considered to be a law of general application. So the question really is, is it appropriate, adapted, appropriate and adapted to achieving some legitimate object of the country concerned? In the case I just cited, <coughs> the moral code, you know, order of society. I mean, just as we have here, we might not agree with them, but just as we have here, various laws that apply, other countries obviously do as well. Now, in relation to that test, and I'm still referring to the decision of WZAPN, there's a reference to the High Court explaining the concept further, that whether the different treatment of different individuals or groups is appropriate and adapted to achieving some legitimate government object depends on the different treatment involved and ultimately whether it offends the standards of civil societies which seek to meet the calls of common humanity. And that is extracted from a case of Chen Shi Hai, C H E N S H I H A I. And there's also reference here to this idea of reasonably appropriate and adapted to serve a legitimate end, which is the test. There's, there's a comment here in this decision about how it has been criticised, um, how um, there is criticism that has um, occurred um, so members of the High Court have criticised the test of whether a law is reasonably appropriate and adapted to serve a legitimate end in the context of assessing whether such a law infringes the constitutional freedom of political expression. Um, so you can see, and um, it probably doesn't come as a surprise, that those that test and those concepts employ maybe do lack a bit of clarity and not particularly clear and there is an issue as to how it should be applied, what it does mean, but it's ultimately a question that will fall within the context, I think, of the particular case that you have. So if a decision that you have turns on this issue of law of general application, then you do have to go on to consider, well, is there that legitimacy? Is there a legitimate object? Has it been or is it being applied, even if it's a law of general application, discriminatorily? Well, I don't think I pronounced that word, but you know, is it is it being applied differently to me because I am of a particular ethnicity? Show you an example. Um, 
fellow with the tattoos, what happened? So can you just play out what happened there in that principle? Yeah, with that principle in relation to the tattoos, there were, like I said, I'm pretty sure it was, it is called the Moral Code, um, that's a type of legislation, and the decision maker found there that um, he's, um, he's not at risk for a, well he's at risk because he's got tattoos, um, but it's not causally connected to the convention and it's simply a law that applies to people with tattoos. And it's a law with a legitimate object being the order or the structure of society. So that's the way in which that aspect was played out. It was a bit more involved because there was the Christianity component, but generally speaking, it was just an example that jumped into my mind because of that um, particular part of the case. So he went back. He was rejected. Mm. Yeah, he was. And that's the thing. In this document, I'm, I attempt to give you examples, uh, and you'll shortly see them, of cases that have won and, and grounds that we can challenge, but you do commonly in this area read decisions that do seem really unfair, and they might be, but you can't do a great deal about that. Um, if I think I mentioned last week that if there's an arguable ground, you should, a client should run it because of the grave consequences, but if there is nothing from a judicial review point of view, if you're just not happy, if you, would, if you don't agree with the decision maker, if you're just not happy about some of the factual findings, um, if there's no basis to argue the case, then there's little value in advising somebody to proceed, obviously. And you give a person false hope and you do all of that. Um, so that's clearly not to be encouraged. And you're, you're left with a number of decisions that you just think this is really unfair. That guy went back. Um, so I think that these sessions need to focus on the positives and applications that do succeed. And again, the need here to come to this area of law with a bit of creativity and thinking certain things and aspects of a decision thoroughly and thinking them through well. Okay? Yeah. So if you do, with the laws of general application, um, look to whether they're being applied to a specific social group, does that bring you back within the convention or is it does it just help strengthen your general application case? Okay. So if somebody's saying that I am, um, uh, these laws affect me because I'm a member of a particular social group, is that what you mean? Yeah, I thought you said before, you, you, once you've got like a law of general application that might apply test, um, then you might start looking at whether they're being applied to a particular social group? Or no? Yeah, you might look at whether um, they're being applied, yes, but they apply to a particular personal group with an aspect of discrimination. They're being applied differently. And so that really takes it effectively outside of that concept of general application. They apply to us all, but they're impacting upon me very differently. That's a legitimate argument to, to level against that type of finding. Okay. Okay. So somehow the combination of the Christianity didn't work for him? Not for him, no. But I haven't gone into the whole Christianity aspect of that decision, but no. There were credit findings, there were a whole bunch of, of findings. But the simple example of the tattoo um, was a finding open and a safe finding for the tribunal to make. So you couldn't perhaps argue that he being a person with tattoos wasn't part of a persecuted group being the part of people with tattoos? Yes, um, but a, a particular social group, a, a person with uh, tattoos, um, I think in that, in that particular um, decision, it was basically found that their laws, I mean, it's like people that leave legally, they're part of a group. People that leave a country illegally are part of a group, but they're part of a group that are going to be subject to a general law that applies. And so if they don't fall within the convention because of that. Does that, does that make sense? So this, this guy, he has tattoos, as do other people, um, but he's only going to be affected by that regardless of whether he falls within a group because of a law of general application. It's a legitimate law 
Does that make sense? So it might discriminate against him because he's got a tattoo. It clearly does. It affects him. But that's the purpose of the law, which is legitimate, affects him and others with tattoos. Now, to take it out of that, there might be a general law, for example, say with, you know, uh, you've got a tattoo, but it is affecting me and it's being applied differently because I'm a Christian. Do you see the difference? Because I'm a particular religion, this general law doesn't just affect people with tattoos, it's affecting me because of my religion. So it kind of, I, I don't think I expressed that well, I apologise, it kind of does inevitably affect a group of people, illegal departures, people with tattoos, but that is why this principle exists. I mean, if it's a legitimate objective, um, if it's um, appropriate and adapted to achieving that legitimate objective, then it takes us outside of the convention. Do you know the name of that case? Um, the tattoo case? No, it's a Federal Circuit Court case. If you Google tattoo Christian, it may very well pop up. So what about laws on homosexuality? We've still got the law. Well, it brings us to, though, um, this idea of appropriate and adapted to achieving some legitimate object. Okay, And it brings us back to whether it offends the standards of civil societies. So it can't just be, you know, of course in Iran there are laws against homosexuality and that's a person's claim. Now, that would not meet the test here. It's a very good question, but it wouldn't meet that test. Does that make sense to people why that wouldn't apply? So the issue is the, the legitimacy of the law. Yes. So is it appropriate and adapted to achieving some legitimate object of the country? Persecuting or discriminating against homosexuals is not appropriate and adapted to achieving a, a, a legitimate object of the country concerned, as an example. So, so we have to make somewhere along the line, <coughs> say the, the, the laws are uh, on the spectrum of uh, not legitimate to quite legitimate, somewhere along that hierarchy there's what we go, well that's not legitimate. Um, a law against homosexuals or Christians or Muslims or women or that's not the gender. Yes, but a law against illegal departures um, so and people coming back is. Yes, that's right. I mean, that's what a decision maker is required to do, applying these principles. Does that make sense? So the dress code is going to fit into that same sort of category as tattoos? Yeah, dress code. I think the provision, actually, have a look at the decision. If I can find during the break the name, I'll give it to you. But that's right. I mean, it, it, it will fit into that. It did in that particular case. So it does require some type of assessment. But the typical example, without wanting to overcomplicate it, is that example of a person leaving illegally. And you can see that, you know, you're going to be questioned, you're going to be interrogated probably, and you're going to be detained. But the other example of <coughs> gays in a particular country, lesbians, that doesn't meet this test. So it's not a subjective test, it is an objective test. <coughs> well, it's a test that the tribunal will need to consider applying these principles. Okay, and they'll need to consider is it appropriate and adapted to achieving the legitimate objective. So from that point of view, <coughs> but would different decision makers maybe come up with different conclusions of what they consider legitimate? Yeah, look, inevitably um, you might get that. You might get um, a, a difference in view. Often, no, and on a practical level, no. I think you get a lot of these decisions that turn on the same type of country information. So you might go for that because it is a, you know, it's a factual decision. It's an, it is an assessment, absolutely. But generally, they fall into line. Well, that's certainly what I've seen. All right. So guys, just moving on from these aspects and points to be aware of, I now want to get into the more uh, substantive matters concerning an actual judicial review um, um, uh, consideration. So the advice that we give, the application that we might draw up. And I've commenced by providing here a practical checklist for merits assessment. Okay, what do you need? We're at that stage where we've got some broad understanding of 
what a refugee is and what the tests and the law says. And now we're about to provide an advice. And we need, first of all, obviously, the tribunal decision. And as I mentioned last week, typically it appears in a um, fairly pro forma um, uh, or the applicant's claims in various forms, so statements, previous hearings, so the delegates hearing. There's usually a summary of what happened at the tribunal hearing country information and then you get findings and reasons. That's very typical, not always, but common. You need the earlier decision of the delegate. So this is, this is a wish list in a sense. To provide the advice, you might not have all of this, but this is ideally what you would have before you. Now the reason why we require the delegate's decision is the tribunal conducts a hearing de novo, okay? So the tribunal is not bound by the delegate's decision. But the evidence presented before the delegate, claims presented before the delegate, and evidence that has been given in some form before the tribunal hearing, before that happens, can be used by the tribunal. So all of that will be before the tribunal and can be used. They're not precluded from using a statement, for example, made by the applicant at the delegates hearing. So we do need that and it is also relevant if we have a type of procedural fairness argument to make and we'll come to that shortly. So just continuing through this list, we also need statutory declarations, all the statements made by the applicant, all submissions made by an applicant. A person can make claims themselves, either at hearing, in a stat deck, in a statement. They are also clearly instructing a, if they've got a lawyer or a migration agent, commonly they do, they're instructing them. So there might be something in a submission that contains additional instructions or additional claims that don't seem apparent in the statement. So it's important that we know what information the tribunal had and what the submissions were. Country information. The recording of the hearing. And I've just noted that as a matter of course, when you're dealing with clients, and I think this is the practice, an FOI request should be made to obtain basically all of this material. Because you're not going to get a client that comes in with all of this beautifully presented. Um, so I think that once you see somebody, you should make an FOI request. Um, in terms of the hearing tapes, again, you don't always need it. My general approach is if I've read a decision and I don't see an arguable point in it, but there are parts that do concern me, um, my general approach is obviously there's a need to be thorough, get the hearing tapes, listen to them, and it might raise an issue, another issue. Um, and an example of that might be that the applicant is recorded as saying something in the tribunal decision and when you listen to the hearing tapes, no such claim was made or it was seriously misconstrued by the tribunal. <coughs> that might be an example. Um, if you're arguing a procedural fairness point as well, if our argument is going to be, well, a lot of things weren't put to me as the applicant, I wasn't aware of a whole bunch of things, you need to listen to the hearing tapes because it might be that things were put. So you can see, just with the use of those two examples, why sometimes it is um, really useful to be able to hear the actual um, RRT hearing. And they could go from anywhere between 
45 minutes to a few hours. Okay, so there, that's our general list of documents to have. You could certainly, though, provide a preliminary opinion, I would have thought, by reading a tribunal decision, looking at it, and at least, even if that's what you've got to begin with, there might be question marks or points that you think might have something in it, but you need a bit more material. Um, so it's, I'm not suggesting here that you can't do anything with the decision because that's the only document that you have at, at that time. There also might be decisions where the error or the mistake is apparent from just reading it. Okay, so we have this material. Ideally, we have all or most of it. And the general approach to judicial review is one that I briefly canvassed last week about being aware of the limitations, um, but also um, knowing the applicable law. And the issue in dispute often is not so much what the law is, but has it been properly applied here? And you would consider some general questions to begin with. So you have your material, you have your RRT decision, and you would turn your mind to a couple of things and ask yourself certain questions. The first one I would suggest is asking yourself the simple question of what were the applicant's claims? And actually writing those down. You know, draw up the line in the middle of a piece of paper if that's your preference, if that works for you. List what were the convention claims made by the applicant. And the reason we do that is because by knowing, it's only by knowing what the claims were that we can obviously consider. The next question is, were they actually, were these claims considered by the tribunal? Were they decided by the tribunal? So I would suggest that as a starting point. And then some of the other questions have the correct test been applied, and, and that's the real chance test, um, uh, persecution, the convention grounds, if there are some exceptions that have been invoked, relocation, laws of general application, has that properly been looked at? How has it been decided? Um, does it appear that matters were raised with the applicant? In that tribunal decision, as I mentioned, you will usually get a summary of the claims at hearing. And you might have in that summary, I asked the applicant, um, uh, why he couldn't relocate. You might get something as clear as that, which suggests to you immediately that relocation was raised. You might not get that in, the, in a decision. You might go to the hearing tapes, have a tribunal decision that turns on that issue of relocation, and find that it was never raised with the applicant. And that would be a very clear example of a denial of procedural fairness, which then relates back to section 425 of the Act, which is the invitation to appear. It can't be a hollow gesture. Um, closely scrutinise the tribunal's reasons, I've suggested here, and ask yourself, just as you would in maybe other areas of law, does something seem unfair or unusual? Is there something in here? Um, and by that, there might be an issue relating to mental health. <coughs> Make a note of that. Um, there might be an issue about an adjournment, a witness not being called. Just consider procedurally, from what you can make of the decision, consider whether any of these types of issues arise. No, no, what happens when people don't have capacity, mental capacity? How do they...? Yeah, look, it's, <laughs> there are 
We have, because you, you do often have people who are just who are not well, given what they've experienced, and then given the protracted um, process here. You will have um, the way in which it's often assessed. I guess is you'll get a decision maker saying, "Well, look, I, I take into account their health issues. I don't find again an assessment. I don't find that it." Um, bore upon their ability to uh, engage in this process. I asked questions, they answered them, um, they appeared to understand. So you might get a decision where if the matter is raised, it's dealt with that way. Um, you might have an applicant who puts forward medical information. And if there is medical information saying this person is not capable of engaging in this process and the tribunal goes on to do that, then I think you'd have a, a very um, strong argument about the process there and whether 425 going there, participating, actually presenting your case has been met. Um, there have been some cases where applicants have engaged in the process. I heard of one case in Darwin and the extra, it was quite extraordinary. The applicant actually had a, an acquired brain injury. And my instructor um, over there had said, who was relaying this case to me, had said that it was just apparent on talking to this person. And because a lot of this stuff is churned out so quickly, you've got people in detention and I don't know how many people were seen, how many statements are made. There was just no real engagement on his behalf. So he was represented, but it wasn't picked up. He had a hearing. Um, extraordinary stuff. And what occurred there, it was a matter that was resolved in that the respondent conceded. So it didn't have to go to court. But a report was obtained confirming that he had acquired brain injury and confirming that he was effectively not able to participate in the hearing. And there's a case of SCAR, Minister versus SCAR, S-C-A-R, which I think is quoted in here a bit later on, where that occurred. Um, in that case, the applicant's, I think, father had just died. There, there were some terrible occurrences for him. And there was none of that information before the tribunal but it was obtained after. So there was a report after that was um, uh, relied upon and whether or not it's the fault of the tribunal comes back to that issue of, well, the Act provides essentially for a fair process for somebody to participate and engage and to appear and did that occur? And in that particular case, no. So. There, it's not an easy ground to run, um, and at the moment there are, there's one case that I know of that the centre has where it's being explored. A woman is very unwell, and we've asked for a, an opinion, and subject to that, it, it might be run. But you do get typically people who are not doing well, but they're able to participate. The difficulty with that is they're probably affected. You know, you, you could understand that, and it might affect memory. Um, ability to convey yourself clearly, coherency, and you might also get adverse credibility findings because of that. And so you typically get a throwaway line of I've, I've taken this into account, but then you get all these credit findings that you wonder to yourself, oh, have you really? And if it's that situation, ordinarily they're difficult to challenge. Um, so these are just some suggested questions and if you have a, a client um, or you know that a client is particularly unwell when they're seeing you or when they've approached the centre, it might be something to, to consider. You might place a question mark over that. Um, another thing that I know um, arises and is difficult to deal with. Uh, psychological reports, you'll have those, or counsellor reports, and not all decision makers, but you can get them dealing 
with them along the lines of, well, it's based on what the applicant has told them. Um, and I'm going to attribute to it very little weight. So you, you get that from time to time and generally, again, you look at the specifics of your case, but generally, not much that you can do about that type of finding on judicial review. So, um, I've extracted further along you know, no overzealous consideration of the decision, but if there are gaps there, they're not to be filled in to favour the respondent, being the minister. We know, because we've gone through the provisions, that section 40, 430 of the Migration Act require reasons to be given in relation to material matters. And if there is an absence of something, if something is not there, in other words, if a claim is not discussed by the tribunal, bearing in mind what their obligation is, bearing that in mind also, well, it, it lends support for an inference that it's just not being considered. So these are some of the cases that I um, know of that reinforce the idea, at least, that ambiguities don't need to be resolved in favour of the, the minister or, more correctly, the tribunal, because that's what we're looking at. <coughs> so, bearing all of those general considerations in mind, we and asking ourselves these particular questions when looking at a tribunal decision. We should then I think um, have in mind some of the <coughs> common errors that do occur and also um, have in mind the way in which we could bring something that we consider to be wrong with the decision into a, uh, an available ground. Okay, and there are there will be overlap. Between some grounds there is sometimes overlap and it's difficult as well to try and shift or pigeonhole things into you know, particular categories. So I don't think that that's the way we start our thought process. I think we started in that broader way, applying our common sense, reading the decision properly and thoroughly, and then just writing out for yourself, you know, what, what sticks out or what concerns you, okay? And then what we do is, there are broad principles um, that uh, the High Court have stated, and it's Cray versus the State of South Australia, and Yusuf's case. And jurisdictional error, and I've extracted the quote, it's an error that causes the tribunal to identify a wrong issue, to ask itself a wrong question, and here, an example there might be, we've spoken about the real chance test, you ask a different question than that, is going to um, amount to an error. Ignoring relevant material, relying on irrelevant material, um, make an, in some circumstances to make an erroneous finding or to reach a mistaken conclusion. And the tribunal's exercise or purported exercise of power is thereby affected, it exceeds its authority or powers. Such an error of law is jurisdictional error which will invalidate any order or decision of the tribunal. It's a fairly, I mean, it's often quoted, but it's pretty broad, and um, there are definitely other cases that consider this and consider the particular um, elements that are provided for here. But how is that broad, general understanding, identifying a wrong issue, asking a wrong question, ignoring relevant material, 
relying on irrelevant material, making um, mistakes, although can I say that factual mistakes often will not get you very far with judicial review applications. And you might have a, a tribunal decision where you do, you read it and you think, well, you know, a small example, now, hang on, the applicant had three brothers, not two, pretty inconsequential. Um, that's not going to get you very far. You might have a decision where um, the country, the claim country is constantly misstated. And again, it would be a matter of degree there because you'd think, well, that, that's probably not enough if it's just a typo or an error, but it might make you think, well, hang on, has the tribunal actually engaged in the claims here? Um, so it's a bit more involved than simply saying factual mistakes don't get you far, but as a general principle, um, it seems to be what the courts say, but I'll take you to that shortly, and I've, I've mentioned that here because you do see it in decisions um, uh, pretty often. So, failure to perform its statutory task is a first ground or a first point that we should consider when, when looking at decisions. Has the tribunal misunderstood its task on review? What is the task? And again, guys, we go back to the relevant provisions that we looked at and that I've outlined in the Migration Act dealing with the grant of a visa and the tribunal's powers. The tribunal's task on review is to form for itself and on the material before it the requisite state of satisfaction under Section 65 which is the grant of a visa provision. Putting aside complementary protection, the criterion is the one set out in section 36.2a, which we know is the refugee definition. And we know what the tests are. We know that it is a forward thinking um, test that is ultimately to be applied. So that is the broad task, if you like, of the tribunal and a really um, a good case to read is this full court decision of Minister of Immigration and Border Protection versus MZYTS and last week we there was a question about country information what do you do with that and country information is one of those areas again where, as a general principle, it's for the tribunal to, you know, to place weight on whatever country information it considers um, appropriate. <coughs> as an aside, though, can I say that many, many years ago, it was never appealed, but I don't know whether it would get very far um, if it was... I'm not suggesting it's a, it's a broad principle, um, but in the federal magistrate's court as it then was, I had a, a case through the centre where Wikipedia had been referred to and relied upon in relation to religion. And the page, you know, the page said, jump on if you want to edit, just to anybody, jump on and, and feel free to make a contribution. It was just shocking. And the tribunal there relied upon that information and an argument was run that it was um, irrelevant because it was so inherently unreliable. And we um, we got up on that argument. I've seen I've seen a Wikipedia type argument run um, in another case, and, and it might not have turned on that completely. But I think it was drowned, I guess, by that general principle. It's for the tribunal to decide what they rely on. But we did succeed, and um, as I said, it wasn't appealed, and it was a really interesting case. Um, I think a number of academics were very happy about it. <laughs> it's shocking to think that these decisions can be made on you know, that type of material. Um, but anyway, as I was saying, country information though is generally for the tribunal. And um, what this case dealt with in MZYTS is an Ethiopian, uh, no sorry, Zimbabwean applicant. And there was country information 
dealing with recent developments and the deterioration in the conditions and the way in which that obviously impacted on the applicant's claims. Remembering that the decision being made about well-founded fear of persecution is as of the date of the tribunal decision. So we've got to remember that. If they're making the decision as of that date, not 12 months ago. Um, so in this case, there was no consideration of that material. So there was no consideration of the country information that had been put to the tribunal. Um, and it was found that the tribunal had misunderstood or failed to undertake its statutory task. And it, the, the case says, well, it, it, it was originally a ground, I think, down below of failing to consider country information. And it all gets a bit, the grounds can be a bit difficult, but they stripped all that back and basically said, well, it really comes down to, was this statutory task um, undertaken? And I've extracted, you can see, a, a bit from that decision because, like I said, it is a good one. Um, paragraph 38, the task could not be lawfully undertaken without a consciousness and consideration of the submissions, evidence and material advanced by the visa applicant, most likely to give the tribunal an ac accurate picture of the ongoing circumstances on the ground in Zimbabwe for him if he were to be returned there. And here we go, 46, Although in one sense this might be described as a failure to consider most recent information or a failure to consider a claim about increased risk of persecution and the increase being because of those recent developments, in our opinion, the error is fundamentally a failure to form the state of satisfaction required for the purposes of the review in relation to section 36 um, 2A. In other words, if you're ignoring a whole body of material there, if you're ignoring essentially a whole claim, um, how is that undertaking um, what the Act effectively requires of a tribunal? So it's not a, um, it's certainly a, a good ground to press in, in an appropriate case, and you can see that it might lend itself to a bit of having a bit of scope. Um, but if in that decision, if there was consideration of that material, if it was just given little weight, then I doubt very much that these findings would have been made. So you would need that type of case. Um, you might get different scenarios, but if you've got something, um, a case where a body of country information has been ignored and is relevant to the claim, then it might um, open a door. <coughs> um, the other case that I've referred to relates to, and that's S S Z J T Q relates to a, it, it, it's somewhat similar and was um, considered to be correct by the full court in the decision that we've just briefly looked at and there it was a failure to consider the most country, the most current country information. So again, that's not going to get us very far if you know, if there's a report that's in 2014 and it adds to or clarifies or you know, um, contains that type of information. If it's simply not considering a you know, December 2014 report over a January 2014 report, might not get us very far. But when you've got somebody saying the circumstances have deteriorated and you've got this body of information which is different in a sense and, and significant, then you could invoke, I think, that type of principle. And that is the most recent country information should have been considered and it wasn't and you could cite this case and the preceding one to back that argument up. So, that is a suggested first issue 
to look at and to, to turn your mind to when reading these decisions. Um, can I just get a time update? Sorry? Quarter to eight. Quarter to eight, great. Okay, so you guys are happy to go along for another 15 and then we'll take a break. Um, now, the next round, failure to, to deal with an integer on a claim. And this is a common ground that arises in these decisions. And it is the reason why, can I say yet again, it is very important that we understand and are aware of what claims were made. Bringing me back to the point of the delegates' decision, the, the list of material that you should have, there might, there might be a claim that was made before a delegate and not made at the tribunal. And you might have a tribunal decision where they say, I've got all the material, I have it all here, um, and I'm making my decision based on all of this. And if there's nothing through this process indicating that there has been a claim that has been abandoned, then it's still a claim that has been advanced and in the right situation or the right set of circumstances ought to have been considered by the tribunal. Okay, so again, just the need to be aware of what claims have been made through the process. And again, there may be a claim unarticulated by the applicant, him or herself, but that appears in the submission. The submission, as a father asylum seeker, the applicant is at risk of return to Sri Lanka. Applicant might not have said that. In the submission, it is a claim. <coughs> um, and I've just repeated some of the general matters about onus of proof. Um, the obligation, what is required of the decision maker is to <coughs> respond to a substantial, clearly articulated argument relying upon established facts. So an articulated argument or claim. If the claim hasn't been made, but if we at this point of reviewing the decision think it should have and that it would have been a pretty good argument, that happens from time to time. It's obviously not going to, to get you anywhere. It has to be a claim that arises, that's, that's been made or that does arise on the material. And Dranignikov is one that I referred to last week and just made the point there, this was the guy that represented himself in the High Court um, in person. Um, and the finding, so what the tribunal there considered Right. The difference here was whether the tribunal erred in law in treating the applicant as a member of the social group of entrepreneurs and or businessmen and not of a more limited group consisting of entrepreneurs and or businessmen who publicly criticised law enforcement authorities for failing to take action against crime or criminals. So that was the difference in that case. There was a consideration of a particular social group, but was it the one articulated by the applicant? No, ultimately, is what the majority found here. Two different claims. Mr. Dranignikov contends in this court that the tribunal misstated and failed to deal with the case presented to it. We accept this to be so. Um, tribunal, and this is the case often referred to in ABE, not obliged to deal with claims that are not articulated. Authority for the proposition that 
an inference is not too readily, you're not going to uh, readily draw an inference that a claim has not been considered when you've got an otherwise a, a detailed decision and it has been mentioned somewhere. I just want to say a couple of things about that broad proposition. You might have, as I referred to earlier, the tribunal decision often comes in parts. So you might actually get the claim that appears somewhere in the decision. It might be where they're restating um, his or her um, statutory declaration. The claim might appear there. But then when you go to findings and reasons, it might not appear there. And our argument would obviously be, well, the inference that ought to be drawn is there has been no consi actual consideration, intellectual engagement with the claim advanced. Um, and the argument against that might be, well, it has been referred to elsewhere in the decision, the tribunal member was aware of it, and it ought to be inferred that it did consider it, but not in favour of the applicant. You might get that type of an argument. But the point I make here is just because it does appear somewhere, don't um, consider that it ends any possible argument. Look into it further. It doesn't necessarily mean um, it's been processed or, or actually decided upon by the tribunal. But there is that broad proposition that where you've got a pretty good decision, a pretty detailed decision, and it appears somewhere, then that inference is not um, likely or readily made. It also might be a case that a finding or a claim doesn't have to be considered because it's basically taken over or subsumed by other findings. Um, an example might be there is a claim that an applicant was in a, a particular relationship that um, prompted religious tensions and, and threats of harm. Now, if a tribunal finds and considers that the relationship did not exist, if that's the ultimate finding, then you might be hard pressed to then go on and try and argue, well, they didn't consider, you know, whether they went out on a particular date or they didn't consider certain factual parts of the claim. It would be difficult because you can see that there's a broader overriding finding that maybe renders that unnecessary. All right, so just um, be aware of those broad principles that do apply when you're asking yourself, in this particular case, were the claims of the applicants considered? And I've extracted here just some examples of um, favourable cases dealing with this issue. So a very um, easy one, I think, to digest is the first dot point, a failure to deal with a more general claim of fear persecution on the grounds of Tamil ethnicity. And you might have a decision, guys, where a whole bunch of claims have been made and you know, I, I had one dealing with a um, Hazara Shia from Afghanistan and just reading it a couple of times, a very apparent thing hit me, which is that the Hazara claim wasn't actually dealt with. Um, a really obvious one and, and the first one in the list of things, but it wasn't dealt with. And you can sometimes skim over those, I think, details or presume that, of course, it's, it's been considered. But there have been cases where it hasn't, and that's obviously a failure to deal with a claim, an integer of a claim, um, ethnicity not dealt with by the tribunal. A failure to consider a claim based on the applicant's status as a returning from Iran, and that he was culturally or socially changed by his long stay in an urban environment, 
It was only considered in this case that I've quoted, MYOA, as to whether he'd been imputed with political opinions and Western affiliations. So again there, you can see in that case there were a number of claims made about return. And um, presumably, I don't have the decision here, but a claim that there's going to be harm or a risk of harm because this person has been away for a long time and is culturally and socially changed. Um, and in this particular case, you can see that various aspects were considered about returning, but not, as an example, that component. And in that case, it was found um, to be a failure warranting intervention. Relocation is the next um, dot point, a failure to deal with the following claim of relocation. And in that case, there had been a claim that there was a particular concern from the rising levels of violence across Pakistan's main centres, as outlined by recent reports, including recent killings in Karachi. So it's a fairly um, a new case, but another good example. That claim, in terms of the recent events, was not considered. And we had a, a, a case here uh, last year sometime where there were, um, it related to activists, so political activities, and the tribunal decision ch um, turned on all this past information, but again, not considering recent developments. There'd been a recent development in terms of um, a, a Facebook posting and some changes in the country. And that just wasn't regarded by the tribunal. The tribunal simply reasoned, you've been doing this for a while, applying the real chance test, it will not, you're not at risk of serious harm. But not considering the additional piece, it's very important, and that was a case that was um, run and uh, conceded. And in these applications, you, when, if you get to a stage of giving advice, drafting, you know, your application or amended application, <coughs> discuss that process, um, <coughs> the amended application, obviously state the grounds, make them, detailed and clear because you can at that stage or up until the hearing, you certainly can have a situation where the respondent minister concedes and agrees that there was an error of some description and agrees to the matter being remitted to the tribunal. And that happens, I mean, it, it happens a fair bit and they don't necessarily want cases um, being decided against them. And if it's a clear error, it makes sense as well to, to concede it. And it's certainly been the experience of the centres here. Some have run, but obviously others, others that have been very strong, they've required the application and they've, they've required the challenge and without it, nothing would have happened and the person would be stuck with the tribunal decision, but it has ultimately resolved without getting to a final hearing. Even in the Morrison era? <laughs> Even in the Morrison era. Yeah. A bad, look, a, a, you know, like, like I said, then, if it's, a, there have been some that you think, oh, this really, you should concede it. Um, and if the error is apparent, then why would they want to just accumulate, yeah. you know, decisions that go against them? Yeah. Um, you know, there's a whole body and it's not touched here and maybe we'll, we'll speak about it on the last, um, during the last session, but this whole thing, I don't know if people have heard about the screening in and screening out and mm -hmm. dealing with offshore applicants. Um, if you're screened out, it was in the papers not that long ago, you, ex, you know, quickly removed. And it's just, it's mind baffling, you know, with this whole process. And the reason I'm raising it now is there have been a couple of challenges and I was involved in one where there was an interlocutory um, um, order sought and ultimately the person was screened back in and I've heard that this does and has happened in other cases and it, you know, the challenge to that process and decision making doesn't reach court. There's a concession of some sort, screened back in, end of matter. 
So, you know, what if they're screened back out and they're already back in their country. I mean, yeah. how do, there's no justice there, is there? No, there isn't. There isn't, and it's you know, I'm definitely a cynic um, with, with good reason. Um, but so anyway, just to, to make the, the concessions still do happen in this area, and you know, the centre has been really successful through its work, through the work of. Now the pro bono council <coughs> having a lot of um, great wins and great concessions made. Did they appeal them very often, the minister? Where, where they're defining the RFP in favour of the applicant? Did they ever see Sorry, guys. That's indicating a break. Uh, no, not often, no. Okay. Sorry about that. All right, look, why don't we just pause there, take a 15 minute break. Okay, so just to finish on the last round that we've been considering before our break, further examples, and you can see, you can see obviously that they are just factual examples that apply in a particular case, but it is helpful, I think, when you start in this area and start doing this type of work to, to have those examples and to see what it looks like in application. Um, another example of a failure to consider a claim is where imprisonment um, had been found likely to occur but was not considered to amount to convention-based harm, and there had been a failure to consider that under complementary protection. And you know that complementary protection is a separate, distinct, distinct basis for a, um, uh, the grant of a visa and that it requires, we went through some of the tests, it requires the decision maker, if rejecting the convention based claim, to go on to consider that. So in this particular claim, uh, case, obviously it had been considered imprisonment, that is, in, under that first aspect, but not under complementary protection, and there it was found to amount to a failure to consider an integer of claim. Um, this, the last dot point is the example that I was broadly referring to of a um, failure to consider a claim that had been raised at an early hearing, in that case an RSA hearing, and the tribunal or the IMR, the Independent Merits Reviewer, made non-qualified statement that he had all the material before him and did not consider that claim, which was not otherwise abandoned. So it's just an example, guys, of a claim being made at some stage in the process that was still alive and wasn't considered and should have been considered. All right, so if you do your own search, you will come up with many other examples, but um, as an overriding consideration, we just keep in mind those broader principles. Is it open to infer here that a claim wasn't considered? Is that inference? Should it be made? And applying your common sense, your general legal skills, you think about when you can draw, when it's open to draw those inferences not mentioned anywhere, or if mentioned, just, you know, token mention at the beginning, not considered. Turn your mind to whether it needed to be considered or was it subsumed in other broader general findings. And then, obviously, ask yourself, was this a clear claim? Was it articulated? And it may be that upon a review of your tribunal decision that you identify particular claims that um, were considered. And some of the claims overlap. You remember that there's also a requirement to consider cumulative, cumulative claims. Um, I had a case, for example, where the applicant fee 
returning to his country. And he had claimed that he had previously been imprisoned for political activism. That happened a long time ago. You know, it was 15, 20 years ago. The tribunal member there considered those claims. But what appeared in the submissions was a claim that the person is at risk of returning, that risk is heightened because he's somebody known to the authorities and because of that previous detention. The tribunal did not consider that claim. So you can see there a decision where the individual claims have been looked at, but on behalf of the applicant, those claims were joined. On their own, they might not have really got him very far and, and findings were made against him, but together, number one, it was a clear claim made, and number two, it's a distinct claim, and it may have actually resulted in, in intervention. So just another example to add to the many that exist in this area, but I do stress that it's a common um, judicial review ground that is argued and it's a common um, consideration I think that you should turn your mind to when looking at tribunal decisions. Now the next heading, failure to consider a factual claim or a factual claim misstated um, and I drafted this a bit in a bit of a rush so if there are typographical errors or spelling mistakes, just be kind and um, indulge me. Um, so general principles noted very briefly before, a wrong finding of fact is not a jurisdictional error. Um, a complaint, again, the decision maker has just not given something enough weight, is not going to constitute error that goes to jurisdiction. There are examples though. In that instance, is there a fairly fine line between not giving sufficient weight and a failure to consider? Uh, look, I think there's a fairly fine line to be quite honest in a lot of these grounds, you know, what is merits review, what is a complaint of just the factual finding, what is judicial review, um, uh, what is a failure to consider or not give enough weight. So I think there is generally a fine line and I don't, um, uh, I think it is, it is difficult but with the question you all just asked, the failure to consider is going to arise where the claim does not appear to have been dealt with. Um, if you've got a claim where the tribunal member does refer to it and does say, well, I um, accept that happened, but I, I give it little weight, or I accept that happened, but it doesn't bear upon, it, it won't have a consequence of serious harm. If it's that type of situation, you're probably not going to get too far because not considering, you need to have a basis to, to argue that that inference should be drawn. And if it's there, but a finding is made that is not agreeable or you think is unfair, that is unlikely to um, uh, support the argument that's not being considered. But in terms of this factual error, because it's an area that causes me, um, you know, certainly concern and a bit of confusion because you have these broad principles that do say, well, if it's a factual error, full stop. And factual errors, I gave the example of two brothers, not three, but there are more serious factual errors that can occur. And there are some cases that you look at um, that seem to maintain that broad principle and rely upon it. Um, but you could imagine that a factual error happens that has a, a really big impact on a person's claim. And I think that if we're in that category, that there are possible arguments that could be made. And when you think it through, if there has been such a misstatement or such an error, then you'd have to wonder to yourself, has the claim actually advanced been considered? Does it bring us back into another 
bracket or grab, which is a claim's not being considered. It's been so thoroughly misconstrued and misidentified that it's in fact not been dealt with. Um, there was an example that I'll go to now, and I'm just trying to go to a couple of the ones that the centres had, but SZQZD, it's, it's only Federal Circuit Court, but it's an interesting <laughs> example because it makes, uh, well, it assists, I think, a bit on, on the point I'm trying to make here, and it also illustrates again the importance of why sometimes listening to a, a hearing, getting the transcript can be very helpful. So in this case, what the tribunal had found, no it wasn't a tribunal, sorry, it was a, a IMR, so an independent merits reviewer, and you know that you might get some of those recommendations, probably not many, so that's why we've not spent a great deal of time on them, but you do know that it's a bit different, procedural fairness broadly applies and did apply in this case. Um, so from that point of view, a bit different to a tribunal decision, but still, I think, helpful to look at. So, in other words, a finding of implausibility that the Taliban would be complicit or be interested in the Nazir party, which is a Hazara party, um, and in common with the Taliban. So a clear implausibility finding. I don't accept your claim, and your claim is the Taliban have an involvement in trying to get your land with this party, which is a Hazara-based party, and these two are in conflict. Why would the Taliban be involved with that party? It's implausible. When we went to the hearing, though, you see that the applicant, because we obtained a transcript that was um, provided to the court, and there's an exchange, a relevant exchange about these issues. There's even a, an attempt to clarify. And you have that applicant saying, no, I did not say when my uncle took the land and said this land will belong to the Nazir party because I work for the Nazir party. That's why this land is for the Nazir party. Also, my uncle told my father to join the Nazir party, so he didn't join. And when he was going outside, so when his father was going outside, he would receive like annoying by Taliban and by Pashtuns. And so what you found, or what was apparent in going to the tribunal, uh, to the uh, reviewer's actual hearing, is the exchange there, further on reviewer, right? So the harassment your father got from the Taliban had nothing to do with your uncle. No. So the claim here, property dispute, Uncle Nazir party threatening the father, and tribunal rejecting it as implausible because the Taliban were involved with the uncle and the Nazir party. Transcript, the applicant actually saying, no, they're, they're separate things. The Taliban <coughs> were involved when my father would go out. The Nazir party and the, my uncle were involved with the property dispute. So, two very different things, but an obvious, significant bearing on the applicant's credibility and on his claims. And the way in which it was argued there, again, we were able to, to bring in procedural fairness because it was an IMR, um, but there was a real focus on this was not a peripheral, insignificant, factual mistake. It was significant. It was central to the applicant's claims, and it was. And it, in turn, resulted in a misstatement. So I stress that just because, you know, when you're applying again in common sense, you just might struggle with the idea that, a, you know, getting the facts wrong is okay. Um, and like I said, there, there, there's a whole lot of authority that says that it's, it's a mistake that's within jurisdiction. It might be that you can or you have a case where it is a very central issue and ask yourself that and there's clearly been an error that impacts on the decision and that ultimately <coughs> means a claim wasn't considered as it was the case in this particular instance. And you know, I remember listening to that hearing tape and just being 
it's always concerning, but particularly again in this area, um, where you think things like that, where it's clarified, where an applicant is struggling to express themselves as well, and that's apparent, mm -hmm. where you can just get you know, such little care, I guess, or, or the pro how something like that could happen, but it, it does happen. So it's important for, um, for us to look at those issues and if something arises where there's an error, to go on and to see whether it can be pushed any further to bring it within. It might not be. It might just be an error that's relatively inconsequential um, and it might be difficult to bring it within um, a, a relevant argument. But that's an example, and one that I've quoted here. Um, so we've looked at the, the integers of claim, the difference between that and factual mistakes or misstatements. Um, failure to consider the material as opposed to integer is the next category. And it maybe ties in the first dot point certainly in what the short exchange that we had, you know, if it's an adequate weight issue, if it's limited weight, no weight, if it's anything along those lines, then it would be difficult to, um, to argue. It will often de depend upon the circumstances of the case. Um, broad propositions are stated here, weighing up of evidence, and evidence can be, there could be a, a, just a lot of different bits and pieces in a refugee uh, case, you know, letters of support, um, letters from um, organisations, uh, um, letters from schools, there could be a, a whole different um, array, and it is for the tribunal to basically weigh all of that up. Um, there is a... There are a couple of cases that I've cited that deal with evidence, so, or material, as opposed to actual claims, and there's a really um, helpful decision to read of Minister for Immigration versus SZRKT, and that's a federal court decision on appeal. And in that case, it was a it was a an academic transcript that had been that hadn't been considered. So it wasn't referred to, and in the particular facts of that claim, it was very important because the tribunal, <laughs> basically without going into all of the detail, it was a, an applicant from Pakistan, and he had made certain claims about a whole range of matters, including part of it was um, immersed in and a chronology and, and having studied and having been at a particular institute for a particular period of time. And it was all, as you can imagine, tied in. And the tribunal did not refer to an academic transcript that was provided. And clearly that particular piece of evidence or the material had the potential of being significant in his case and um, bearing upon you know, decisions as to, to what had occurred to the applicant. Um, there's the finding that he hadn't studied. If you strip it all back, and like I said, it was all interwoven, but a finding that he had not attended that school. And you've got a transcript, which on the face of it, confirms that he did. Then in this particular case, and the reason it's a good one is um, the judge, she goes through a range of the conflicting authorities and many of the authorities quoted by the respondent minister saying, well, material, it's a matter for the tribunal and doesn't need to be considered and, you know, it's just part of the weighing up process. And she goes through a lot of those um, uh, decisions. And in, in this particular case, given the significance of the material, it was found um, that it 
it was a requirement that it ought to be considered and it was an error not to. Um, in this case, the Minister appealed or attempted to appeal. They um, uh, made a special leave application to the High Court, which was pleasingly um, uh, refused. And in the special leave transcript, you have um, the court, the High Court saying, the lower federal court judge, Justice Robertson, um, in a careful judgment, was at pains to make it clear that to ignore relevant material is not necessarily to fall into jurisdictional error. And we know that, and the case law overwhelmingly does say that. Uh, oh, his honest conclusion was based upon his honest view of the significance of the error that was made in this particular case. So drawing it back to how significant was it? Um, the decision below turned on the evaluation of the significance of matters of fact for the, the, the decision by the tribunal. And the decision was also endorsed by MZYTS. That was the case that we looked at earlier, dealing with the statutory function, what is the tribunal required to do, it was the country information case by the full court. It was endorsed there, um, and the court there, the full court said that by disavowing any jurisdictional, non-jurisdictional <coughs> distinction between claims and evidence, and instead finding correctly, in our respectful opinion, that the fundamental question must be the importance of the material to the exercise of the tribunal's function and thus the seriousness of any error. So they themselves are saying they're, well, getting rid of those distinctions that are often unhelpful, um, it comes down to the importance and the significance of the material that you're dealing with. Okay, and that's an example where it was found to constitute error. There will be many, again, where pieces of the material supplied or evidence might not have been considered, but in the circumstances of that case, um, it may not have been central, important, significant to the claim. And, yeah, so anyway, um, I think that's a, a helpful case and a helpful way to, to think of, of the material before the tribunal and, and how it's considered. Okay, so moving on from that area of failing to consider either integers, or facts wrong, or ignoring material, we then come to procedural fairness. And we are aware of the provisions in the Migration Act um, in relation to natural justice, or to 4B. And I have extracted here some. Oh, oh that was right on the um, some, some general propositions in terms of what is procedural fairness mean. And again, I don't think that these broad principles are going to cause anybody any real difficulty um, because it comes down to how do you conduct a hearing with somebody in a manner that is fair? And obviously that means giving the person an opportunity to be heard, putting to them relevant and significant matters. Um, and these are all stated in various ways by the courts. So SZBEL, which is a decision that we'll talk a bit more about, General proposition, party affected by a decision must be given the opportunity of ascertaining the relevant issues and to be informed of the nature and content of adverse material. <coughs> um, yes? How does that apply to ASIO findings? Sorry, if there's an adverse ASIO finding against your client, do you get the opportunity to um, look, access that and respond to it or not? No, look, there are, I haven't really touched upon it here, but there are exceptions, um, and it's public interest, confidentiality, there's a provision in the Act, I can find it for you once we finish, um, where that would probably, I dare say, fall under. Um, so you don't, you know, we don't often, certainly in these decisions, and I know that there are all um, the... ASIO decisions where 
the applicants have had an opportunity to put something forward, so there was that process of engaging, but I was speaking to lawyers engaged in that, and they don't have any information, so they're literally making submissions for people without knowing anything, so it's all a bit farcical, and, but I think that's how I think it would fall under that. Um, so anyway, these are the broad general propositions. What does it mean to be fair? Again, though, we should bear in mind we went through country information. Um, if it's not put to an applicant at a tribunal hearing, is that likely to bring us within an argument or a denial of procedural fairness? Probably not, we say, because um, 424A3, remember there's that exception in the Act that says you've got to provide material um, to an applicant that is going to be or might form part of the decision, but certain material is excluded and we recall that one lot is information that is not about the applicant but a general class of people. Okay, so just with country information, again, <coughs> IMR is open. Independent Merits Review, open because it wasn't regulated by the Migration Act. Um, tribunal decisions, country information, that's probably the sticking point. But go on to consider it if it's significant and see if there are any um, aspects that you can look into. But it's generally where um, you stop. So fairness is not an abstract concept, it's essentially practical. The concern of the law is to avoid practical injustice. And you can see there other broad propositions that I won't um, take you through. Now, there are examples of a denial of procedural fairness. The refusal without any reasoned basis of the adjournment application was considered to be a denial of procedural fairness or otherwise unreasonable, an unreasonable exercise of the MRT in that case, Migration Review Tribunal's discretion, but equally it would have application to the Refugee Review Tribunal because we noted last week some of the provisions mirror each other. Um, but in SZBEL, um, what the complaint was there was that a number of findings against the applicant, and there were three elements um, and I, I won't read what in particular they were, but there were three elements to his claim, factual components important to his claim, um, that um, were relied upon by the applicant. And again, they were important, and they were found to be by the tribunal implausible. So these three specific Elements and I mean, just as an example, the first one in this case, he described returning to his home for medical treatment, meeting four of his friends, and telling them of what he learned about Christianity. And his friends indicated they were disturbed by what he was telling them. They urged him to renounce it. And a few days later, he started receiving uh, threatening calls. That's one, and then he had two other important, fairly central claims that were made. Now, the delegate considered the applicant's claims, obviously, because that is the first step, as we know, and only considered, only dealt directly with one of the three elements. So it was otherwise silent on the other two claims that had been advanced. The tribunal here asked the applicant various questions during the hearing and the tribunal, as I've indicated, went on to make findings of implausibility on those three points and ultimately they influenced or 
dictated the rejection of the applicant's claims. And the High Court speaks about procedural fairness, refers to Section 425 of the Migration Act that we have ourselves and <coughs> referred to a number of times, and says, first, the Migration Act obliges the tribunal to invite the applicant to appear before the tribunal to give evidence and present arguments relating to the issues arising in relation to the decision under review. And that is simply the section extracted. But it is important because it's about appearing to give evidence, make arguments relating to the issues arising in relation to the decision under review. So relating to those issues. Um, the tribunal is not bound to extend such an invitation um, if it decides the, uh, obviously, the case in favour of the applicant. Um, now, the court went on to say that the Act defines the nature of the opportunity to be heard, that is to be given to an applicant for review, and again repeats what we've just extracted, 425, the reference to the issues arising in relation to the decision under review is important. So that's what, in this case, they really um, um, uh, referred to and, and considered essential. Those issues will not be sufficiently identified in every case by describing them simply as whether the applicant is entitled to a protection visa. So simply saying, are you entitled to a protection visa doesn't necessarily define or identify what those issues are. Um, the issues arising in relation to a decision under review are to be identified having regard not only to the fact that the tribunal may exercise all the powers and discretions by the Act on the original decision maker, but also to the fact that the tribunal is to review that particular decision for which the decision maker will then give reasons. It makes the point, tribunal is not confined to the reasons given by the delegate. And as I noted before, tribunal is not bound by those reasons. It's a hearing de novo. The issues that arise in relation to the decision are to be identified by the tribunal. But if the tribunal takes no step to identify some issue, other than those of the delegate considered dispositive and does not tell the applicant what the other issue is, the applicant is entitled to assume that the issues the delegate considered dispositive are the issues arising in relation to the review. Okay, so if there are no steps taken to identify <coughs> what the issues are, then an applicant can really and is entitled to rely upon the delegate's findings. Um, and the applicant or the appellant in this case was not put on notice. What? There we go. <laughs> <laughs> We're all too still. <laughs> so look, the, the appellant there wasn't put on notice in any way that these three specific or at least two issues were um, were issues, in fact. And effectively, the first time the appellant would have known that, when you think about it, again, just being very practical, is when the appellant probably read the RIT decision. So the point here in terms <coughs> of procedural fairness is the issues need to be identified. And we had, you know, and there are examples. If you don't identify that relocation is an issue um, and say nothing to the applicant, then the argument is that is a denial of procedural fairness and or a breach of section 425 of the Act. Um, if you make no um, issue of the applicant's employment, and it might be important. I had an Iraqi firefighter once 
it was really important to his overall claims. If you don't make that an issue, his employment, and then you find that for whatever reason you don't accept it in the decision, then again, has there been a denial of procedural fairness? Has there been an opportunity to put forward, to respond, to appear in relation to the issues under review? Um, you have to, when you're dealing with this ground or this issue, um, you have to bear in mind that it is not simply, you don't require in every case, for example, a tribunal member saying, I do not believe that you were a, an Iraqi firefighter. Okay, I don't think that that's what is actually required. And in fact, if you had that, and if you had somebody repeatedly saying that, you might be arguing that there's a bit of apprehended bias or some problem with that. So it's not so much being that I mean, upfront that, that is necessarily required. You could do that in another way. You might ask questions about the employment. You might ask questions that, um, you know, in some way, testing knowledge, testing things about it, in some way that identify, uh, identifies it as an issue. But if you've got a case, for example, where there's just nothing on it, there's no questioning, again, the importance of transcripts in procedural fairness cases, um, when it is absent, or in fact, if you have a tribunal member actually agreeing or you know, conveying an acceptance and then suddenly, for whatever reason, there's a rejection, again, that, that might raise <coughs> this issue. Um, so it is important to consider what was said at the tribunal hearing, whether there was, you know, whether there were expressions of doubt or testing of knowledge or something that makes it <coughs> an issue. Um, whether the delegate, whether the decision below identified and dealt with the claims. So an example, if. Um, <laughs> if in this case um, uh, there had been a finding by the delegate in SFBL that there had been no such conversation with his friends, I think we just referred to the first ground, no such conversation and they didn't go on and make those threats. If that finding had been made and later on the tribunal didn't discuss it with the applicant, it would probably be difficult to strongly argue a denial of procedural fairness because the applicant is on notice, is on notice that that is an issue. So of course in these areas there are always greys and, and um, little different arguments that, that might develop or different points that you can take, but generally speaking with procedural fairness in looking at these decisions, ask yourself, you know, uh, was there a fair opportunity to be heard? Were matters that are that were issues decided against the applicant? Were those matters put to the applicant? Had they been put to the applicant at any stage in the refugee refugee review process? <coughs> was the applicant on notice? And then, if you satisfy yourself that he or she was not on notice, that this is a, an issue decided um, blindly, really, fit for the applicant, then it may provide us a basis to argue um, a, a denial of procedural fairness. Or 425, and, and that's really what SNBEL deals with, the functioning of that particular section and what it means clearly. <coughs> um, there are just a, a couple of um, examples given here 
But again, if you have a bit of a look around, I'm sure you can find others and it is most useful, I think, to have that broad framework that I've just discussed when you're considering um, these points. And from that point of view, with these matters, and you're going to be dealing with clients at all stages, no doubt, um, and it might be that at this stage you don't see a client, that you're just given a decision and you're asked to look at it and to provide an opinion. And that's okay because often it's not really an area where you require um, in detail your client's instructions. I mean, you obviously need your client's instructions to act or to do anything. I'm not suggesting that, but in terms of the, the error, I mean, you'll commonly get people just saying, look, it's, it's wrong and it's unfair, and you'll explain to your client that, you know, they, they probably, usually, do not give evidence at court, cost implications, that it's not a hearing like the tribunal, it's nothing like that. But sometimes when, if you get the opportunity to have that conference and to talk to them, it is a useful thing, I, I think, to, to ask, well, how did you feel during the hearing and, and you know, have you read the decision? What do you think? And it might be that, um, you know, it might be that when you're going through the decision, the, the person does say, well, I didn't know that, or there might be something useful that, that comes out. So it depends on the case, it depends on your opportunity, but sometimes, you know, you might canvas those issues with, with the client that you see. Um, I think that's probably enough said in relation to procedural fairness in 425. Um, just jumping over, before we go to unreasonableness, I know I'll just I'll keep in, I'll keep in order. Um, Unreasonableness or illegitimacy. Um, this is certainly when I was starting off, I would try and not to say that I don't put forward this argument, but things would just so often seem to me to be really unreasonable that um, it was a popular argument and one that really didn't, in my experience, succeed um, that often. It's a high threshold, um, unreasonableness. Um, I had quoted some of the leading cases. There's the High Court case of Minister for Immigration and Citizenship versus, versus SZMDS. Um, and they extracted broad principles. No rational or logical decision maker could arrive on the same evidence to that, that, to that conclusion. Not every lapse in logic will give rise to jurisdictional error. Courts should be slow, although not unwilling, to interfere in an appropriate case. Tests for illogicality or rationality must be to ask whether logical or rational or reasonable minds might adopt different reasoning or might differ in any decision or finding to be made on evidence upon which the decision is made or based. So effectively, could no other reasonably minded decision maker have reached that decision? And that, you can tell, and it's expressed in some different ways, but for our purposes, let's strip it down to that. It's a high threshold because you might not have made that decision. If you have courts, judges, noting that they might not have made that decision, um, but again, it's an area that really brings up that tenuous line between what is merits review, what is a complaint of the decision, of the facts, and what is a complaint in relation to something that is capable of constituting jurisdictional error. Fine line, but this is often where I think applicants are criticised or it's noted that it's more so the, the former and that is just an attack on the merits. It's a high threshold, not one that should never be argued, of course, um, but it's, you know, you're going to read many decisions that strike you as unreasonable, but it's not to say, I mean, it sounds really doom and gloom, doesn't it? But you're likely to. Um, it doesn't mean, though, that it will reach 
that um, threshold of unreasonableness as stated by the authorities. Um, having said that, all right, and there are a few other um, points made here, although we've referred to Lee's case dealing with the discretion and whether that was um, exercised unreasonable, unreasonably, and that was the adjournment, and we've got the High Court decision there finding in favour of the applicant. Again, MRT, but of relevance and a useful case to read, guys, if any of you are interested. Um, there have been a couple of recent Federal Circuit Court cases dealing with the issue of unreasonableness, and I don't know whether they have been appealed, I'm not sure if, if they are, and I'm not sure what the result of that would be, but I've just extracted here, uh, under examples, two fairly recent Federal Circuit Court decisions that um, did find uh, that the decision maker was unreasonable. The first one, there were three factors to satisfy um, that legal unreasonableness had been established. And just so that we can get a bit of a flavour for some of the cases and how they're, they're run, first, the reviewer's adverse credibility finding against the applicant was based on a false factual premise that the applicant had made no disclosure of sexual torture whilst detained on Christmas Island. So that's interesting, and it's interesting because it you know, dips into what we were talking about before, about the possible misstatements or, or errors and how they might bear upon a decision. So that's the first reason. The secondly, the reviewer paid no regard to the obvious reluctance on the part of the applicant to discuss the details of the torture at the RSA interview, the delegates interview, this is an IMR RSA um, decision. Thirdly, the reviewer failed to inform himself of the correct approach to dealing with claims of sexual torture as set out in the guidelines produced by the Minister's Department and the Tribunal. Instead, the reviewer relied upon the fact that a box had been ticked on the report of the initial entry interview, indicating that the applicant had revealed everything material to um, their claims. Combination of circumstances satisfies me that in so far as it dealt with the issue of sexual torture, it was unreasonable in the required legal sense. And because of the importance, bringing it back to how important is this, um, it was fatally flawed was the conclusion in this recent um, Federal Circuit Court decision. The second example that I've extracted here um, deals with um, a, uh, an Egyptian applicant and a um, Christian woman in Cairo, and there was an, a lot of information basically talking about the persecution of an unaccompanied um, woman, and it was, whether you could say exclusively, but it was overwhelmingly in support of the applicant and in support of women. It was argued in, in various ways, particular social group and religion, um, but it was very much in support of, of her case. And so in this uh, August 2014 decision, you have recorded here, and I literally just lifted this up from the decision, the applicant submitted and the court is satisfied that the commissions and consequently the tribunal's findings are incapable of rationally or logically leading to any conclusion other than the applicant's subjective fears of persecution were well founded. To find otherwise is unreasonable and irreconcilable with the finding made by the tribunal at paragraph 105 of its decision. And I can indicate that paragraph <coughs> dealt with information that, that reiterated the dangers to people in this situation. As a result, jurisdictional error in the tribunal's decision is made out. So another example, um, but equally, you know, there, there might have been something there, um, even if limited, some material favouring or, or operating against the applicant's claim, and I don't know, I mean, it might have been open to, to find that the high threshold was, was not met. That would be the argument, no doubt put. But in that case, we have a recent example of an unreasonableness finding. So... Again, you can see that a fair bit is extracted here. I'll move on though because I'm pretty anxious to finish up on this. Um, 
tonight and what I want to do next week is look at, I think, look at other aspects that we might confront as far as court and this process is concerned. Um, reinstatement, extension of time applications, injunctions, appeals to the federal court, applications to the high court. And I also want to talk a bit more about complementary protection on that occasion because you can see I've just, and maybe give you some examples as well, because I haven't dealt with it here, I just figured it was a bit too um, broad and um, too much to deal with um, tonight. I also wanted to say in relation to complementary protection that I had noted <coughs> last week that um, uh, there was authority and there indeed is authority for the proposition that if a person has made a protection measure application before complementary protection came in and it was only decided on convention and, and obviously not complementary protection because it didn't exist, um, that they can make another application, okay? Because they're two distinct bases. Indeed, that was the case and the courts upheld that, but it has been amended. And so that is no longer the case. And as I understand it, the centre, upon learning of that, rushed in, because it's not retrospective, rushed in as many mm. applications based on complementary protection that they could. So I wanted to clear that up. I apologise for that. Um, uh, error, but that's apparently what has happened. And again, even in relation to that, I would be interested in maybe thinking a bit more about whether that is capable, that amendment, of challenge. Because, you know, you're blocking an application, you're blocking a substantive application that could be made. But look, question marks hover all around that. It's an interesting um, uh, idea. Moving on with our document though, I've also got a section credibility and I've really included that because we will come across a lot of decisions that are based on adverse credibility findings. Um, and there are some that you can, you know, some adverse credibility findings that you can appreciate might be open. Um, if you've said one thing in a statement and then you're saying something differently at the hearing, it's completely different and it contradicts what you've earlier said, you can see, again, not having to confine it to this area whatsoever, you can see that you would be asking, well, hang on, how credible or reliable is this? And that's um, uh, open. Um, in these decisions, you will, and I also think that that's why so much attention was um, given to this issue by Con when he was going through the need to get it right to begin with. And I can, you know, I just completely support that because adverse credibility findings are also drawn, for example, by failure to <coughs> mention something earlier. You didn't mention it earlier, you're mentioning it now that provides a basis to dismiss a claim. And it may very well be because somebody never asked and you guys have gone through how to sit with the client, how to get instructions. Um, you know, you can't just sit there and expect the client to, you know, you, you need to ask questions um, and you need to be thorough. And there, uh, many complaints of that not occurring, you know, when you speak to people that that doesn't happen. So there are instances where adverse credibility findings are made and you can see how and why. There are also other instances, um, common occurrences, where small, you know, what you might consider a relatively peripheral differences. Um, you know, I had one where there was a finding um, as to credibility because he said that this young applicant said that he had placed, I don't know, thousands of CD covers in a bag and there was a finding there that, oh, no bag would, would carry those adverse cred credibility findings. And it perplexing because why wouldn't a bag hold so many CD covers? Um, but there are some times, you, you read the decisions um, at times and you do 
wonder about the adverse credibility aspect um, of them. And again, we've got people who are not particularly well, whose memories may not be particularly good. Um, and if there was ever an area where you would think some, you know, some leniency or understanding, not even leniency, it would be extended, it's this area, but it is, um, it's often not. And you'll come across decision makers that, you know, have their own formulate type approach. You will. Um, and there'll be some decisions that you read where you think to yourself, from the outset, you know, this person wasn't going to be believed. Um, and, yeah, I think it's a really, it's a very difficult area because when a decision turns on adverse credibility findings, they, they're notoriously difficult to challenge as well because credit is a matter of impression, is a matter of, you know, the, the tribunal listening, hearing the evidence, and it is really, as a general principle, it is a matter for the tribunal. They're the ones that make those particular findings. So they are very difficult um, to challenge.